Hi, I want to introduce to you guys a wonderful pianist, John Wolf, and he is the champion of this year's artistic practicing process intensive in which we are trying to find different strategies to look at the big picture so that every note has a, an extraordinary context and meaning in the large picture. And John is such a wonderful people person. He is kind and he's always encouraging to other participants, um, very inclusive and uh, just a, a joy to have in class. And the biggest transformation that I saw in him is just this opening up of the emotions, the emotional channels and the emotional energy and the flow and taking more time for the expression to come out. So let's see what he has to say and a little bit of his playing. Hi, I'm Sing Aishu. I'm here at the Numix Studio in New York City, and I am thrilled to be speaking with John Wolf today. Hi, John. Hello, Sing Ai. John is our champion of the artistic practice intensive this year at the Numix Studio. And um, John, you just gave this fabulous performance of an excerpt from um, Albanese's Iberia, and you got the most votes from your peers. So how did that feel when you found out? Well, it's an honor, of course, um, but I also know that everybody did a fabulous job, and, and I was really impressed with how all the participants seemed to be playing with um, more musicality and more confidence. Um, by the end of the six weeks and everything. I, I just think we all did a great job. I think um, when, in terms of practice, I think I recognize that um, my approach to practicing and uh, to playing, you know, even like my, you know, trying to be more mindful of my body and the tension, all these things um, hasn't been effective enough. Um, so that I've been able to you know, get my playing to a good level, but satisfying level, but not as far as I knew it, it could go. And so I think that having um, ideas, lots of ideas about how to strategize, um, planning your practice, what to actually focus on, um, how to do a really deep dive into the music so that you can create an artistic vision that you want to communicate to others. So um, I really, I, I think that uh, having someone else guide that, um, the forming of habits and the process of practicing is really helpful. That's awesome. And what has uh, been the biggest change in, in the way that you use the actual practice time that you get? Well, um, some of the biggest changes um, have been about trying to do mental practice. So practice that isn't necessarily with my fingers and hands on the keyboard. Um, so sometimes I'll take a piece of score uh, with me when I do hikes and things like that, and I'll find a very nice natural place. Um, you know, I, I feel like part of my pursuit of music is a pursuit of beauty. And uh, also that is tied in with my pursuit of, of hiking and being in a, in a gorgeous natural environment. And so I'll sit there and, and I will look at the score, I'll hear it, sometimes I'll finger it, um, study it to, to see if I can uh, get more expression and also to be more secure with my knowledge of the piece. Um, I think another thing that has really been helpful is tying my breath to my playing. And uh, especially with the melody, but just in general with how the breath helps to make the music flow and uh, go to peaks and then to relax and to places of tension and release. And so that I know that the next steps are to be a lot more aware, body aware, that mind-body connection that um, we talked about during the intensive. And was there a particular spot that you found you tend to hold your tension in? I'm really bad about shoulders. Um, and I have been ever since I was younger, but I was never told not to or made aware of that I was doing that. So, um, you know, I'm learning to arch and relax and do things that will help me to, to, to let that go, free myself from it. That's great. You know, I remember when I was a kid, people were always telling us kids, 
uh, lower your shoulders, lower your shoulders to the point where we were like physically like pushing them down. <laughs> it didn't relax anything. It just made it tight in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but what's great is uh, kind of getting a whole collection of different tools for all kinds of body types and body patterns and then seeing which one fits the best for you and you know try them all on for size and really personalizing things and letting um, our intuition figure out what is exactly the best response How now what was the most difficult thing about this uh, intensive process and also getting ready for this contest day there's such a wealth of ideas and everything that you really can't just integrate it all at once and I know that I'm going to be thinking about and using these strategies for a long time. And uh, we have to change old habits and create new ones. Um, so uh, that, that's something that was difficult about it. Um, I, I didn't have as much time as I might have liked to have because I was with my son at the birth of my second grandchild and everything and um, taking care of the four-year-old. So my practice time was limited to nap time and late at night. But um, in some ways, I think that was also advantageous because I really concentrated and I knew I had to be efficient. Mm -hmm. Right, having limits sometimes is, is great for sharpening our thinking and what we intentionally want to do. I congratulate you on uh, having you know, welcoming new life into your family. I remember when my daughter was born, boy, suddenly, like, all my practicing was in five-minute intervals. <laughs> Being a grandparent is a little bit uh, nicer because, you know, when the baby gets fussy or needs a diaper change, you just hand them off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were there making it work with uh, uh, on-the-road computer setup and uh, yeah, just, just fitting everything in together, which is awesome. Uh, was there anything in the preparation of this um, Albanese that surprised you? Like anything in the score that you didn't think you were gonna get and then, I don't know, that, that you discovered along the way? Probably, I think the first thing that attracted me to it was the, the whole soundscape of it because it's like telling the story of ancient Spain and so there's so much exotic color in the harmonies and interesting intervals in the melodies and um, so I started I think really connecting mostly with the melody at first and looking for where the music would really grow and then I began to realize that there are beautiful color tones that I, I wanted to try to bring out in uh, the harmonies or just individual um, notes. Um, and then I think it, it occurred to me or finally hit me that, you know, all this little bit of syncopation in the left hand is really related to some dance, some kind of folk dance and everything. So I was trying to give it a lot of, uh, of movement as well. I want to say a huge thank you to Rocky Ridge Adult Piano Seminar for giving us the scholarship prize that goes along with this contest. And John, I can't wait to see you in person over there in the beginning of August in the mountains. It was, has always been a fabulous experience and um, both musically and as far as sharing music with other people who have that same love and desire to grow and learn and share. And also, we're going to be doing an uh, analysis session with me. I'd love to talk about your background because um, I know you started early uh, with piano already in your life, right? When I was right before my seventh birthday, uh, my mother caught me sneaking into the living room, which was, you know, against all the house rules and just quietly playing on the piano. And so she saw my curiosity and she said, would you like to take piano lessons? And I had never thought about that before, but it was like, oh, yes, of course. Uh -huh. And I was so excited about the piano lessons that um, <clears throat> a couple of weeks before the lessons were to begin, I fell out of a tree and I hurt my right arm. And I didn't, I didn't tell my parents because I, I didn't want to lose out on starting piano lessons. Oh so 
Um, they they eventually figured that I was holding my arm funny. Why are you doing that? And they took me and got x-rayed and, and it was a hairline fracture. And um, I, I was just in tears. And my mother called the piano teacher and said, can you just teach him the left hand for a while? <laughs> so for the first month I learned, um, you know, the CBA going down notes with my left hand. And uh, I, I always loved it. It was, uh, a, you know, fun for me. It was an intellectual pursuit. And um, since we're gonna be talking about emotional connections, I have to say that I think the first time that I really emotionally connected with the piece was about, I'd been playing for maybe a year, and there was a little piece in one of the, you know, method books that I was in that was uh, a transcription of an opera melody. And it, I remember it being E minor, and it was a descending left-hand melody with a kind of pulsating right hand. And, you know, I, I had a beautiful childhood with all happy feelings. And so this is the first time that I really connected to a different feeling that I'd never experienced before. And uh, I know that when I played it on a recital, um, also that I connected that emotion and was able to communicate it with the audience and everything. So um, I continue playing. Um, through my adolescence, I was, uh, you know, pretty lazy. But uh, I did decide to uh, major in piano in college, and then I really worked hard and um, just pursued it as much as I could. And then after college, I decided to uh, <clears throat> go into the classroom as a classroom teacher and do piano lessons with kids on the side. It eventually led to doing a lot of accompanying and collaborative work with uh, high school students and, and choirs and things like that. And, um, now, at this point in my life, it's nice because I'm back to exploring, you know, uh, music for myself and trying to find opportunities to share it with others. That's great. Tell us about your beautiful house there. <laughs> well, um, I moved to Estes Park, Colorado two years ago, and I could not find a house that I really felt like um, would do justice to a grand piano or maybe having a small audience in the house. So I did find a local builder who uh, wanted to help me with that vision. And he connected me with a, an architect that just did a stunning job of um, producing the effect of bringing the outside in. So um, I, I get to look out every day and I see Rocky Mountain National Park um, out one side and I have this beautiful mountainside on the uh, other direction. So I feel very, very fortunate and it's a, it's a lovely place to be. Amazing. And really connecting with nature. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of talk these days about how we are all like so sucked into our devices. And here you are really connecting um, every time you go home <laughs> in nature, you're in it all the time. That must have been an amazing way to live life. It helps you to connect to beauty and uh, truth and, uh, and just a universality. Okay, so if there are people out there who are thinking about getting more serious with their piano studies, but who are afraid to find out just how extraordinary they could be, or who are afraid to have a failure, what would you say to encourage them? Well, I'd, I'd say that, you know, just exploring someplace like Rocky Ridge, um, you know, you, you, it's a safe environment. You've got lots of supportive people and lots of good direction, uh, a great faculty. Um, finding someone that you feel like um, can take you step, the, the steps that you need to move forward and uh, to probably recognize that you probably can't do it by yourself. That's great. And um, what has been your experience doing Zoom lessons with me? <laughs> well, of course, it, it's so much better to, to be in person. Um, I, I'm sure that there are things, especially the mind-body connection, that you could probably, you know, help me with even more. But um, I can't imagine not having it. You know, what if we didn't have Zoom? I, I would just be floundering. I would still be doing the same old thing I've always done. I'm so happy that you and other people are willing to adapt to the way that our reality is. Mm. you have a favorite uh, type of music that you like to play? Or do you like to explore? 
I definitely like to explore music and uh, when I start exploring I get sometimes a little obsessive about it. So um, we had a retired music history professor who was giving a class at the local library on Prokofiev. I was very much inspired to listen to all of the sonatas and um, I picked number nine to, to tackle and um, I also got out Visions Fugitives, which I had played a few of them when I was in college. And so I like to play lots of things. And uh, so now I'm kind of in this Spanish music phase. So I've got uh, Granados, The Maiden and the Nightingale going along with a couple of Albanists. And um, so I'll, I'll probably move on to another composer in another phase as soon as I find what grabs me. Wonderful. That's such a great creative spirit. And there was this one part, the interior of the peninsula is a vast plain and it's pretty treeless. And there's um, little hills that have like stone castles on them, little medieval castles in a medieval town at the base. And then far in the distance, you see the snow-capped Pyrenees Mountains. So that's kind of the image. Um, it also has a lot of kind of gypsy roots to it 